All right, good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to class this morning. Uh, this is going to be our second lesson on the issue of uh, ambassadorship and evangelism. So last Sunday what we did is we tried to lay some groundwork. I'm not going to all that stuff, but we talked about our um, heavenly conversation. And we define conversation out of the dictionary as a place. Remember that? We went over that information last Sunday. And we talked about how we have a heavenly conversation, but we have an earthly ambassadorship. And then we also discussed at the very end how not only do we have an earthly ambassadorship, but that our ministry as ambassadors reaches not just here on earth, but also into the heavenly places. And we left off by looking at Ephesians chapter 3. So I'm sort of on purpose making the decision here to not do a lot of extensive review. I, I want to I wanna move through the material at a uh, seemingly reasonable pace. <clears throat> and all that information is in the first lesson. So what I've done on, our, on the church YouTube page, I have created a playlist for ambassadorship. And on the church webpage, I've created a new class entry for uh, ambassadorship. So um, by the time we're done, there will be an, an entry on the webpage that has all these lessons organized under ambassadorship. And then also the same thing on the church webpage. So where we left off uh, at the very end last time was in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 9, 10, and 11. Where Paul says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we were talking at the very end last time about not, how not only are we Christ's ambassadors on earth, but that we also have a teaching ministry that extends throughout the heavenly places and that the principalities and powers in heavenly places learn things about the manifold wisdom of God through watching the church, the body of Christ in operation. So this is all going on right now. Somebody at the end says, I, I think that the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, both the, the good ones and the bad ones, if you will, are exposed to this information through the ministry of the church, the body of Christ. Now, obviously, some of them hate that information. They don't like that information because it demonstrates and manifests that they picked the wrong side, okay, because of the revelation of the mystery. And so um, I, I, wanna, I do want to sort of touch on that here because it helps to establish something, okay? If we're ambassadors... And we're left here in Christ's stead like we saw last time, okay? And we understand in an earthly sense what an ambassador is as a representative of a nation in a foreign country. Remember that, okay? We also understand that we were a part, that, that we were part of the kingdom of darkness, but now we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear what? Dear son, right? And so we, we've had a complete change in this situation. Well, you have to understand that you're, you are an ambassador of heaven left here on earth in Christ's stead in a hostile environment, okay? The, print, the God of this world and his, his course and the things that he has going on are hostile to you as an ambassador of Christ, okay? They are not, oh, good, we're so glad you're here. What do you have to say? There is an opposition that is actively working against you as an ambassador, right? That's the course of the world, right? Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, he talks about this present evil what? It, this present evil world, right? Uh, we, we understand it based upon, you're in Ephesians, just go back to chapter 2 quick. We understand that there's a course that the world is on. We understand that the lost are a part of it. And we understand that they are um, following, that the person that charted this is the prince of the power of the air. Look at Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So you think about ambassadorship. Sometimes you, if, if, if you're an ambassador in an earthly sense, sometimes you are fortunate enough to get an appointment to a country that is friendly with you. 
right? But sometimes you get an appointment to a country that is not what? Friendly. Not friendly with you, okay? We have an appointment in a, in a kingdom and in a country here, if I'm just using that illustration, that is not friendly towards us as members of the church, the body of Christ. That does not like the manifold wisdom of God, that does not want to hear about the wisdom of God in the mystery and justification by grace through faith. They don't want that information, and there is a course of the world that is actively seeking to oppose that information. Okay, So you have to understand that as we seek to carry forth this ambassadorship, this earthly ambassadorship in Christ's stead, that there's going to be opposition. Okay, That as we do that, not only here on earth, but as that ministry extends into the heavenly places, they're, they're not happy about that either. And so one of the things that Satan is trying to do is to keep a lid on this thing, right? He will do whatever he feels is necessary to try to keep ambassadors from uh, you know, following through with, with their ambassadorship. And that's because this is an embarrassment to to Satan himself. And I just want to stress this point. Come with me quickly and get Ezekiel. Well, no, first, get get 1 Corinthians chapter 2 again. We did read this verse last time. Did Satan know about the mystery? No. no. The reason he didn't know about it is because Paul explicitly says that it was hid in who? It was hid in God. Okay? It was not in the Old Testament. It, it, it was hidden in God. It was not hidden in the prophetic scriptures like some assert. It was hidden in God. Okay, So when the revelation of the mystery is made known and revealed, is Satan just as shocked by this information as anybody else is um, within the nation of Israel or anywhere else? Right. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have what? So if, if, if Satan and his cohorts or his minions or whatever term you want to use for it, if they had known about the, if they had known about the wisdom of God and the mystery, would they have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? No. So by keeping a secret about all that would be accomplished at that cross, Satan unwittingly, unknowingly commits something and does something that is going to ultimately be the end and ruination of his entire uh, system, of his entire plan of evil or policy of evil, if you will. Okay. Now, go back to Ezekiel 28. We understand, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time going over this. We've done it before in other studies, and it's, look, it's self-evident that when Ezekiel is talking here about the king of Tyrus, is he talking about the earthly king of Tyrus? No. He's talking about the person that is behind that individual, right? He's talking about who the, he that was in Eden, the garden of God. If you just look at a few verses quickly, look at verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. So who's that? That's, that's referring to, not to the physical earthly king of Tyrus. That is him. That is the prophet here speaking to the individual that is behind that situation, right? Who was in Eden? Who was in Eden, the Garden of God? The serpent. Adam, Eve, God, and who? The serpent. Okay. Verse 13, Thou hast been eating the garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee from the day thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub. That's who he's talking to. Okay, I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created till iniquity was what? Found in thee by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Okay? So this is clearly, in my opinion, a reference to who? Lucifer, Satan, before he what? Before he fell, right? Okay? Now, go back to verse one and verses 1, 2, and 3. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because, thou, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, 
I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thy heart as God. Behold, thou art wiser than who? Daniel, there is no what? See, so you have to understand something here. People, are, have a, people function theologically under the misconception that the main issue between God and Satan is over power and authority. Does Satan, does Lucifer understand that he is a created being? Does he understand that he is created by God, that he is a contingent being, and that God, he owes his existence to the creative work and genius of God Almighty? Okay? The issue between God and Satan in your Bible is never one of power. It is never, that's never the issue. It has always been one of wisdom. Who better has, who has the superior wisdom and knows better how to what? Run the show. Say, you just read the verse. Go back to verse 12. Son of man, take of a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of what? Wisdom and perfect in what? Lucifer thought, I have a higher wisdom. I know better about how to what? Run the show. And his boast is there's no secret that you can what? According to verse 3, no secret. Thou art wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that can be what? Hid from thee. So what does God do? He just keeps a what? He keeps a secret. Okay? He, he, he keeps a secret. He holds something back. Come over to Job chapter 5. <coughs> Job chapter 5. Look with me at verse 13. Speaking about God, it says that he taketh the wise in their own what? Craftiness. And the counsel of the forward is, is carried headlong. So if, if Lucifer's original boast was, I'm, what you, there's nothing, I'm wiser than you are, there's nothing that you can know that I can't what? No. What does God do? Does he allow him to think that while he just holds some information back? Okay. Uh, the comparative passage that you want for Job 5 is 1 Corinthians 3. Come over to 1 Corinthians 3. Now, some of you that have been with us for a while, this isn't the first time you've heard me talk about these things. Okay. But they're pertinent to what we're talking about here, about ambassadorship. And I'm, I'm hoping to demonstrate to you why that is here in a few minutes. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own what? Okay. If Satan, for we speak the wisdom of God, Paul says in chapter 2, we speak the wisdom of God how? In a mystery, which, which uh, nah, I'm messing it up. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden what? Wisdom. Lucifer said, there's no secret that you can what? Hide from me, right? But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world what? Yeah. Knew. For had they known it, they would not have what? Crucified the Lord of glory. So, would Lucifer and his cohorts have, cru have crucified Christ if they had known about the wisdom of God in the mystery? The hidden wisdom of God. No. So is God taking the wise in their own craftiness here by simply keeping some information secret about what would be accomplished through that cross? Okay. Now come over to Colossians chapter 2. Chapter 1, he talks about the mystery, the hidden wisdom. Why don't you stop at chapter 1 quick. In verse 25, Paul says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been what? Hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his what? Saints. Come over, come over to chapter 2, look at verse 14. 
In verse 13 he says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all what? Trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. That's referring to the law, right? And took it out of the way, nailing it where? To his cross. Where did the Lord Jesus Christ satisfy the righteous requirements of the law? On the cross. If Satan had known, if the princes of this world had known about the wisdom of God and the mystery, the hidden wisdom, they would not have what? Crucified the Lord of glory, right? Well, why? Look at the next verse. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them what? Openly, Openly triumphing over them in it. What is the it referring to? The cross. Okay? So the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ... And the full revelation through the Apostle Paul of all that was accomplished on that cross puts the principalities and powers in heavenly places to open what? Shame. Demonstrating, manifesting, and declaring that they didn't really know everything they thought they what? Knew. Is everybody with that? Okay. Now. Jesus Christ, by simply keeping a secret about what he was going to accomplish, put Satan and his minions to open shame, according to Ephesians 3.10. We do the same. Now, when we make known the manifold wisdom of God in a mystery, we're reminding them, actively, functionally reminding them of the fact that they didn't really know what? What was going on. What was going on. Okay. Now, if you are going to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ today, whether you're talking about salvation and justification, or you're talking about having all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, and all men seeing the fellowship of the mystery, okay? If you're talking about those two things, you are fundamentally going to be proclaiming the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Correct? And in doing that, do they want that message either for salvation and justification or for edification and establishment? Do they want that message known? No, they do not. Okay. So as an ambassador of that message, as an ambassador of that information, both for justification and salvation, which would be evangelism, but also for establishment and edification, both of those things, they are opposed to that issue. Is everybody understanding that? So now, as an ambassador that's left here in Christ's stead, should you expect and anticipate a hostile reception to that information that you are left here to represent? You should. Now, it seems to me that th that is absolutely essential. If you are going to be an effective ambassador, you have to understand the circumstances and the conditions into which you are placed. Is everybody following what I'm saying? Okay. So, you think about this. <laughs> uh, come with me to 1 Timothy 5. The adversary has aligned himself against this information. He has aligned himself against the message of the cross. Okay. Now, before you before we look there, I just want you to go just go back with me just quickly to 2 Corinthians 5. I just want to read this again. Now, I have, it, I have the intention that we will study as part of this series, this passage quite intently, okay? Especially given the current controversy surrounding it. But he says here, um, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, he says in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? Creature. Creature. Okay? Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. So, that only applies to the person that's where? In Christ. in Christ. The person that is not in Christ are all, are all, the person that is not in Christ are all things become new. No. Yes or no? No. No. And, verse 18, 
all things are of God, who hath reconciled us. Well, the us there, not here I am already teaching this, okay? The us that are reconciled are those who are in Christ in the previous verse. Okay? Not those who are outside of Christ, not those things to whom all things have not been made new. Okay? And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of what? Reconciliation. Now, if you're going to preach the message of reconciliation, are you fundamentally going to be preaching the cross work of Christ? The cross work of Christ, as I've already said, applies not just to the issue of justification and salvation, but it also applies to the issue of edification and establishment. Okay? Because if what establishes the believer is an understanding of the mystery... Does Satan want that information made known? He does not. So he is opposed to both aspects of the preaching of the cross. How, Paul says, he, uh, go, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish what? Foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is what? The power of God, right? So the power of God today is in the preaching of the cross. The preaching of the cross has the power to justify, to save, to establish, and edify. All those things. Okay? And if that is what puts Satan and his minions to open shame, demonstrates to, them, demonstrates to the universe openly that they didn't know everything they thought they knew... And God, seeking to take the wise in his own craftiness, causes Satan to bring forth the very thing that's going to be his ultimate undoing. Does he want people to know about that? Okay. So I know I told you to go to, back to 1 Corinthians 1, but I changed my mind. Go back to 1 Timothy 5. First Timothy five, verse uh, verse uh, fourteen. Okay, that's an interesting verse here. He says, "I will therefore that the younger women marry, build children, uh, bear children. Sorry, <laughs> Go ahead and kind of do that. guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak what reproachfully for some." are already turned aside after who? Now, if you read the whole thing, he's not just talking about women there, okay? So this is not like a sexist comment that only women are turned aside after Satan, because that's certainly not the case, especially when he's already identified men earlier in the book who are teaching the wrong doctrine. And uh, if you go back to chapter 1 and verse 20, he mentions Hymenaeus and Alexander who... I've delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme, right? So, but the point here is, notice what he says in verse 15, that some are already turned aside after who? Satan, okay? Now, I just want you to think with me about all the places where Paul warns in his epistles about the tactics of the adversary, Okay? So I want I want to run some I want to run some things just run some references and look at some things here right, but according to that verse, is it cap are, is a believer capable of being turned aside after Satan? Okay, so let's look at some of these some of these things. Come with me first. Go to Ephesians six. Okay, Ephesians 6, verse 11. He says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against what? The wiles. The wiles of who? The devil. the devil. Now, what are the wiles of the devil? The wiles of the devil are the scheming, trickery, the trickeration. If I could use that word. Okay. Uh, to... 
you know, it's like you, it's like in football where you fool the defense into thinking you're doing this. Meanwhile, you got some guy coming out over here with the ball and he runs and scores, kind of a thing, right? When I think of wiles of the devil, I think of Bugs Bunny and Wiley Coyote, and he's always got some scheme, some way he's going to try to do what? Catch the road runner, right? Okay. But he says here, Paul warns, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So you're going to need to put on the armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against <clears throat> the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So is there going to be a struggle? Are you going to be opposed as you go to carry out this ambassadorship? Okay. So much so that he talks about some armor that you're going to have to gird and arm yourself with. Okay, more about that in a different lesson. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all the stand, stand therefore having your loins gird about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of who? So, in this passage, does Satan have wiles? Paul talks about him firing fiery what? Darts at the believer, right? So there's all this terminology that is used. Come to 2 Corinthians 2. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 2. Verse 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his what? Devices. Okay? So he's got wiles, he's got devices, he's got fiery darts, he's got tactics that he seeks to use and employ against believers. Okay? Against members of the church, the body of Christ. You're in 2 Corinthians, come over to chapter 11. Look at verses 3 and 4. Chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, he says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye received another spirit, whom, whom ye have not received, or another gospel, <coughs> which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. But So in this passage, he, it, it's, he's talking about subtlety. He's talking about seeking to corrupt their minds away from the simplicity that is where. In Christ. So, so far, he's got wiles, he's got fiery darts, he's got devices, he's going to use subtlety. Come to the same chapter, go to verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to his work, their work. So he's got false teachers that are teaching things that they ought not. He says in the pastoral epistles that they're teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's what? Sake, okay? So there's, a, there's all of these things that are out there, okay? Uh, come to Galatians 3. Chapter 3, look at verse 1. All this stuff is designed to do this. O foolish Galatians, who hath what? Bewitched you. Bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth and crucified among you. Okay? Bewitch, deceive, beguile, all this terminology is used by Paul to describe the, the adversary. Okay? In 1 Timothy chapter 4, he talks about seducing spirits and doctrines of what? Devils, okay. It's Second Timothy. We should. Do you want to? Maybe we should go to all these verses. But if you go to go to Ephesians four, speaking about being bewitched, 
He says that you henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning what? Craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So it's going to be cunning, it's going to be crafty, it's going to be subtle. Satan has his devices, he's working all of these, these angles and these strategies. Come, come to Colossians 2. Verse 8, <coughs> the believer is warned to beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after who? And not after Christ. So there's, there's things that we're instructed to be beware of. I already made reference to it, but, but go to 1 Timothy 4. I know we're running a lot of verses here. But again, you got to understand, does, does Satan want a member of the body of Christ to make abject profession of faith in the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or does he want to do everything he can to shut that testimony down? And you have to understand the reason why. The reason why is because it is an embarrassment to him. And it demonstrates and puts him to open shame that he really is not who he said he was and who he claimed to be. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of what? So there's winds of doctrine, there's doctrines of devils, there's false teaching, there's cunning craftiness. Come to 2 Timothy 3. There's, speaking about these people in the last days, they're in verse 2, they're lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce bakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Sound like anybody you'd really want to hang out with. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, but look at verse 5, having a form of what? See, the form of, you, you, might, you might not want to hang out with a covetous boaster who's proud and blasphemes, but you might be seduced by somebody that has a form of what? Godliness. Okay? So they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such do what? Turn away. So you have a form of godliness in verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. You have evil men and seducers. And then finally, chapter 2, verse 6. Um, no, maybe it's 1 Timothy. Hang on. We'll find it. Maybe it's Titus. It's very possible there's a typo. No, what, I'm looking for the verse where he talks about the snare of the devil. Have the maybe I want 26. That's the problem. I have Second Timothy two six. I forgot the two. <laughs> verse twenty six, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of who? The devil who are taken captive. Now, what's a snare? A trap, a hit that you don't see. But notice what Paul says about these people that are embracing and understanding and so forth false doctrine. He says that they need to recover themselves out of the snare of who? What the devil is trying to do is ensnare believers. Okay, He's trying to block the truth of the gospel of Christ, the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's trying to ensnare believers. Now, does he want you to be saved at all? No. no. If he cannot stop you from being saved, if you hear the gospel and believe the gospel, does he wish to keep you in doctrinal confusion? Okay. So, just think about, I'm just going to run back through the list. Here's the terminology we've seen. Okay. The wiles of the devil, the fiery darts of the wicked, Satan's devices, beguile, beguile sub-subtle, false apostles, bewitched, cunning craftiness, okay, 
uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, a form of godliness, evil men and seducers, and the snare of the devil. It's a pretty lengthy list of things that, that Paul's identifying in his epistles. Okay, Now come with me to Acts 20. So do you get the idea that there's some information that the adversary does not want folks to get? Okay. We could also add to that that he's blinding the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should do what? Does he want to keep people in the dark with respect to the gospel? Yes. Okay, Acts 20. <coughs> now with all that in mind, let's read this passage here. This is Paul talking to the Ephesian elders. Okay, And he says to them, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this. Does Paul know this is going to happen? Okay. He says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing what? The flock. And also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn you every night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all that which are sanctified. Then notice, what's going to build you up? Now he's talking to believers here, obviously. But the word of His grace is going to be the thing that builds you up, right? Amen. So the wiles, the strategy, the devices, the subtil the subtlety, all this stuff is going to be designed against that which is going to ground, build up, and establish the believer. Okay? So it seems to me that some of the first steps towards being an, effect an effective ambassador is number one, recognizing our heavenly conversation. Number two, recognizing that we have been placed on earth in Christ's stead to teach the ministry of reconciliation. Number three, realize that our ministry extends into the heavenly places <clears throat> as we teach the principalities and powers in heavenly places the manifold wisdom of God. And fourth, understand that Satan hates the message of grace and the preaching of the cross. He hates the preaching of the cross for salvation and justification, and he hates the preaching of the cross for edification and establishment. In both arenas, he despises it. Okay? So, we have to understand then that as an ambassador, I am drawing a blank. Where is the verse where he talks? Is it in Philippians where he talks about having been translated? No, it's in Colossians. Go to Colossians 1. <coughs> Colossians chapter 1. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear what? His dear son. His dear son. Okay. So where are you now? You are in Christ. If you are in Christ, are you seated with him in heavenly places? Do you have a conversation and a place for our conversation? Our place of living is where? In heaven, right? But in the meantime, are you left in earth, on earth, in Christ's stead to be an ambassador for Christ? To rep See, you represent who now? Christ. But you are representing him to and in and with that, that, as it says right there, that power of darkness that you were once a member of. So are they going to like anything, really, that you have to say? 
No. So now you understand why Paul tells, why Paul says that you're going to have to gird up your loins. I mean, it's a, if, if this is really true and we really believe this, then there's something spiritual going on here and Paul's not playing around. Okay? You guys understanding that? Now, this seems like an appropriate spot to stop and see if there's any questions or comments so far <coughs> before we get into sort of the next section. They should, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm talking to today and showing her some verses and well, that doesn't really mean that. That means that I don't know. It means what it says. You know, words have meaning. And, but right away you can tell that the fight, the fight, you know, I don't we don't yell or nothing, but you, there's a fight going on. And it's different than arguing about something that doesn't matter, something in the physical football or football or like whether or not Star Wars ruined it in the last movie. Because that's clear. It's a reality. What, what Paul's saying, it's a, what you're saying too. It's, it's, it's true. It's a reality. We, we, we experience it. Anyone else? I don't. I mean, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation here. But does anybody else have a Caleb? Would you have a? <laughs> I have you to thank for my profound wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, never mind. Anyway, so he um, he believes that we're um, among a variety of other things that we're spiritual Israel. And whenever I try to have a conversation with him to and kind of show him some things, I mean, like Ernie was saying, we don't yell at each other, but he get, I can tell that you know he's digging in his heels and it's, there's like a resistance to what I'm saying. Amen. Yeah. And no matter what I point out, it's like, okay, what about this then? He's like, well, you know, really, if you go back here to the Hebrew or whatever, he's into studying the Hebrew. I'm like, well, you know, I just can't get through it all. Yeah, I think there's opposition from lost people toward the gospel and their salvation and justification. And I think there's opposition to um, who are, people who I'm assuming are saved, okay, who are, you know, churched people who maybe are in their own denominational tradition, whatever that is, who don't, who don't want to change, okay? But the bottom line is, so what we've done is, I, I've tried to establish for you here, okay, this is how Paul talks about this. This is how he talks about the conduct of the adversary, okay? So what I want to do in the last 15 minutes is I want to sort of flip that now and talk about Paul's consistent testimony to the believer that you and I are in a battle, okay? A spiritual battle. And to kick that off, go back to Ephesians 6. So I want to get through this point today, and then that will probably take us up to the... To the end of time today. So go back to Ephesians 6 and look with me again at verses 10 and 12, 10 through 12. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. Where? So the struggle that Paul's talking about, the wrestling here, is not physical in nature. 
Okay? So Ernie's talking about this scenario with his neighbor, right? Ernie's not like, Ernie's not like on the ground trying to, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat sort of wrestle. That's not what it's talking about, right? It's referring to something spiritual. So it's a conflict, it's a combat, it's spiritual in nature, and it is involving spiritual armaments, tactics, uh, and, and so on and so forth, okay? So the contrary doctrine, the contrary winds of doctrine that we established in the last point are seeking and are going to come against the believer, okay? So Paul's, uh, because of that, there are scriptures in the Pauline epistles that are very clear and talk very and talk openly about the nature of battle and warfare okay so let's look at some of these and this is how we'll finish the lesson come to philippians chapter 1 yeah you we're coming on the end here the nfl season and so you know people are watching a lot of football maybe i don't know but you think about a defense what is a defense supposed to do Hold the line, right? Stop or prevent the offense from what? Scoring. Scoring. They're to defend their goal line so that the other team doesn't what? Score. score. Doesn't score points, okay? <coughs> Even you think about, so as you watch or don't watch football to whatever extent that is, if the defense stops the other team, they'll often say, well, they held them. Or something to that effect, right? So they, they, they accomplish their objective in holding the other team from what? From scoring, okay? Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Paul says, Even as meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Does Paul view himself as needing to defend the gospel? Because he knows that that message is going to come under what? Attack. It's coming under fire. There are devices, there are wiles, there are things that are designed to neutralize it, to render it ineffective. That the adversary is working like we saw in the last point. Okay, Look at verse 17. Same chapter, verse 17. He says, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of what? The gospel. Okay, so Paul knows and understands that he is going to have to defend something. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. <coughs> Verse 18. This is Paul writing to Timothy here, and he says, I charge... I, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest do what? War a good what? Does Paul tell Timothy that he's in a war? Okay. He's telling him to fight a good warfare. Come to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good what? Soldier of Jesus Christ. No man, no man that warreth entangling himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a what? So we see... The defense of the gospel, we see the issue of warring a good warfare, we see the issue of fighting the good fight of faith here. In, in, oh, I skipped one, didn't I? Did we read 1 Timothy 6, 12? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Just turn back two pages or a page to 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. He says, fight the good fight of faith. So does he perceive that there's a fight going on? Okay, so all this language, wrestling and fighting and warfare and, and, and all this is, is designed, and, and being a good soldier and so forth is designed to get in your mind, to get in the believer's mind that, that there's a spiritual reality that's going on here. Now, I feel like what we too often do is we become distracted by the fact that the physical does not necessarily always entail direct opposition. 
So I can go to my friend's house, Ernie can go to his friend's house, and he can sit there and play cards, not bring up any of this stuff, and have fun. Yep. Right? Or he can go over there and bring it up and know he's got a fight on his hands. Okay? So then that raises the question of, well, isn't it easier for us a lot of the time just to shut up? Shut up. Just to not say anything? Just to let things roll and, well, eventually it'll come up and so forth, right? Now, I think you need to be tactical. I think you need to be polite. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into some of that later on when we talk about some of the practical you know, a applications of what we're doing here. But for now, understand that you can, you can go to a family gathering, you can go to work, you can hang out with your friends, you can do whatever you're doing, and you can have a fun time with people and not bring this stuff up, or you can bring this stuff up and just know that it's going to not go very well. Okay? Now, that's not every time. Don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that that applies every time. You guys understand what I'm saying, I think. But you think about this warfare. You know, one of the things that happens in warfare is that you, there's, there's captives. There's spoils of what? That's why it says, therefore, let no man what? Spoil you. Okay? Because you could be taken captive. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2. We already read it. Verse 26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken what? Captive. Captive. That snare takes the animal. If an animal is caught in a snare, can it get away? Is it the captive of the snare? Okay. How much time we got left on the camera, Ron? All right. Thank you. Go to chapter 4. This is Paul now at the end of his life. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Last epistle, last chapter of the last epistle that Paul writes. Notice what he says. <clears throat> he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Remember, remember all that stuff back in 1 Corinthians? About how he keeps his body under subjection, lest by any means when he has preached to others, he himself should be a what? cast away and how he keeps his body under subjection and so forth and he uses the illustration of a runner running in the games right here he's saying for I, I, have fought, I have fought a good fight I have finished my course I have kept what the faith, the faith. What verse you have, Brian? I'm in second Timothy 4 7 yeah. okay. okay so the battles are the battles that are being fought here are not physical Sometimes people get mad and they, you know, but what the, the, the battle that Paul's envisioning here is not with flesh and what? Blood. It's a spiritual battle with spiritual realities. And it's being fought around this book. That's where it's being fought. I'm not going to make a big point about it today, but just think through that just for a minute. That means this book is important. Does the adversary have an interest in trying to undermine the authority of this book? Has he demonstrated that in Genesis 3? Yea, hath God what? Said. So this book itself is going to be part of the what? Part of the fight. Identifying, holding forth what God's word is, is going to be a part of that, right? Because a lot of this stuff is going to be based upon, it's going to be affected by what, the, what that book has to say, okay? So the, the that means, therefore, that the theater, you know, you, you think about war, think about World War II, right? You had the Pacific theater, and then you had the European theater, right? Those are words to describe where the battles were being what? Fought. Fought. So the theater of the battle that we're talking about here is, is, not, is not really at the bar. It's not at the movie theater. It's going to be in the churches. It's going to be in the Bible colleges, the Bible institutes, and the, and the seminaries. It's going to be being fought where people are handling, promoting, and seeking to 
understand what God's word is. The lost man, does he care two hoots about any of that? No. no. The lost man, is he already blind and does Satan already have him where he wants him? Yes. Okay. But you need to understand that our ambassadorship, as we proclaim the cross work of Christ, is to give testimony to the ministry of reconciliation. That's the issue of salvation and justification. But it is also to have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of what? Truth, truth. The truth. So for me, as I think about ambassadorship and I think about, you know, evangelism to me is only one part of that issue. There's the other part of it too, which is establishment and edification. Okay? So a while is a cleverly designed trick or device by which someone deceives another. Cunningly produced, it causes somebody to be taken in by fooling him or her into accepting something that is true, which in reality is not. Okay? Now, we'll close here. Go to 2 Corinthians 10. I did a whole series of studies in the main Sunday morning service. They're all on the internet <coughs> some years ago now about the battlefield of what? The mind. 2 Timothy chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not what? So again, this battle is not playing out in places where the word of God is not being handled and discussed. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God are the pulling down of strongholds. <coughs> Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every what? See, there's a captivity that you want to be involved in. You don't want to be that you don't want to be 2 Timothy 2:26 captive in a snare. You want to get out ahead of that and take all every thought what? Captive to the obedience of who? Of Christ. Okay? Because there's a policy of evil that the adversary has to have you be the captive, not have you being the one taking every thought what? Captive. All right, we are pretty much out of time. I'm sure we're right on the money on the video. Um, so, Ron, if you want to stop the video, and then uh, we'll take... We